Good evening, uh, panel of attendees out there in Webland. I'm Howard Mandel, president of the Jazz Journalists Association, uh, coming to you from the Brooklyn via the cloud offices of the Jazz Journalists Association. And you are at Museums and Communities Keeping Jazz Alive. This is a panel discussion, uh, the fifth in the Jazz Journalists Association's monthly online webinar panel series, which is brought to you by the Jazz Cruise with, uh, as part of its Anita Berry Education Fund with additional support from uh, Century Media Partners. Uh, I should let you know that all Talking Jazz webinars and panels are archived for free access by the Jazz Journalists Association on YouTube. So if you have to step away, you can see the uh, part that you missed immediately afterwards. But if you're watching live, you're invited to type questions or comments into the chat box on your screen, and I'll try to get them into the discussion when it's appropriate. Uh, although we may focus that on the last 30 minutes of our 90-minute session. So now let me introduce our panelists. This is Marsha Baird Burris from the Anacostia Community Museum. We have Michael Cogswell, Executive Director of the Louis Armstrong House Museum in Corona, Queens. And Ken Kimmery, Executive Director of the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra and the Jazz Oral History Project of the Smithsonian. And that is a brief introduction to them, but I'll ask each of them to say hello and to say a little bit more about the mission of their um, uh, institutions. So, Marshall, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about the Anacostia Community Museum, just a little bit. Okay. Well, first of all, I'm delighted to be here this evening to participate, and I'm looking forward to sharing uh, a lot of information and, and also learning information. Uh, I am the public affairs specialist with the Smithsonian's Anacostia Community Museum. We are one of the Smithsonian's 19 museums uh, and, and various research centers. And um, we've been around since 1967. Uh, when we opened, very quickly, because we were in a largely African-American community, our focus sort of uh, became rather than a, um, a place for the Smithsonian to kind of uh, tell the community about what was down on the mall, it we focused on African American history and culture because that's what the community wanted. And so we did that for pretty much most of our existence. We've recently, over the last couple of years, changed our mission to kind of expand it and using the history of working as, you know, probably the first federally funded community museum, we now look at communities from a broader perspective. We look at the issues that impact contemporary communities focusing primarily on urban communities like Anacostia, which is where we are, and other communities. So that's it in a nutshell. We will get back to you and expand that nutshell, open it up. Michael, tell us something about the Louis Armstrong House Museum. Well, it's my great privilege to be the director of the Louis Armstrong House Museum. Louis and his wife, Lucille, who was a cotton club dancer, purchased a house in Corona, Queens in 1943, and they lived there for the rest of their lives. And today their house is a National Historic Landmark, a New York City Landmark. It's open as a historic house. It's unchanged. Nobody's lived in the house since Louis and Lucille. Everything is perfectly preserved. And People come from all over the world to visit. We're open six days a week, 52 weeks per year. The second program we do is collect materials about Louis Armstrong. Discovered in the house, since Louis was a pack rat, was a treasure trove of material. 5,000 photographs, 85 scrapbooks, 650 home recorded tapes, 270 sets of band parts, five gold plated trumpets, and on and on and on. We took all that stuff to the library at Queens College, we're a cultural center at Queens College, and preserved it and cataloged it, because we couldn't do that inside the historic house. But we've continued to collect the materials I just mentioned. That's one collection. We now have eight Louis Armstrong collections. So uh, we have researchers from all over the world to work with those collections. There have been a couple of dozen new books and videos and broadcasts on Louis Armstrong that have used our materials. 
And then we also put on concerts and exhibitions and other public programs. But our two core programs are tours of the historic house and access to the research collections. Thank you. And Ken, uh, the Smithsonian, nobody really knows what the Smithsonian is, so please uh, <laughs> give a little nutshell explanation of your obscure institution and, uh, uh, and the Smithsonian Masterworks Jazz Orchestra, too. Absolutely. It so happens that today is the, uh, used to be a science and technology, but the American history's 50th birthday. Uh, today, in 1964, the building was uh, christened and opened, and um, here we are uh, celebrating uh, this wonderful expanded vision from where it first began. And what I do, uh, in a nutshell, uh, since 1993, have managed or been involved in management of this living exhibition we look at it, which is the Smithsonian Jazz Masterworks Orchestra, taking uh, the museum's collections and uh, bringing them to life through this wonderful vehicle of this 16-piece orchestra. Uh, Washington, uh, we have a Washington season, and then also we take it nationally and internationally around the world. So uh, with the, uh, the birth of the orchestra, Prior to that came the Ellington Collection, and the birth of the orchestra was federally charted and funded. And um, so we continue to do that, not with just with the Ellington Collection, but also <laughs> other collections that come into the museum, that being the Benny Carter Collection, Horst and Fletcher, Fletcher Henderson Collection, um, Bill Holman, Bill Russo, and on. As for the um, other hat that I wear, which is the Jazz or History Program, I've been involved in that also since uh, my... Uh, my uh, early years uh, in the museum, and that is going out and collecting life oral history interviews uh, with um, those in the jazz community, being um, musicians, uh, those uh, presenters uh, in the, the record industry, and it has amassed up to uh, 300 plus interviews that have uh, found themselves in the museum's ar uh, archive center and available for anybody and everybody to uh, have access to. Excellent, excellent. I'll say also that we've already received a note from um, uh, someone involved with the Seattle Art Museum, so we know that we do have a live audience that's involved with this uh, co um, concept of museums and communities having interaction, engagement, and that's really what we want to talk about more today. Um, uh, the Anacostia Museum is Nominally, the Anacostia Community Museum, Marcia, you've said that that's community is the, is the subject of, uh, of, of your interests in, in programming. And Michael, we know that Louis Armstrong loved being in the community. I always think of that photo of Louis on the uh, steps of the house, uh, surrounded by kids and showing them his trumpet. And um, certainly the Smithsonian is, uh, is the museum for all of our community in the United States of America. So. That's really exciting. But let me ask you, have, uh, how, how can communities work their way into your programming, into your uh, activities, so that museums are not simply repositories, uh, mm -hmm. so that you are living uh, institutions that way, and uh, adapting to uh, living communities? Well, you know, um, and I think you were directing that question to me, uh, that's actually what distinguishes the Anacostia Community Museum of the Smithsonian um, from our larger brothers and sisters out there. Um, we are a museum that was essentially born in the uh, um, east of the river communities of Washington, D.C., otherwise known as Southeast. We're east of the river, farthest east of the river. And um, all of our programming from our inception has been has been developed out of the community. Um, as a matter of fact, as I sort of spoke to earlier, uh, the museum was actually put there not to be an African American museum, but to be an, an outreach center uh, for the Smithsonian. And the first year, there were uh, bits and pieces of, of um, exhibits brought in from other museums to say to that community, come on down to the mall. But the community, uh, at that time decided, well, you know what, if there's going to be a museum here, we want it to focus on our interest. And the community, as I said, was largely African American, and so that's how the museum actually moved into focus on, on, on uh, you know, an ethnic focus. 
the approach of the museum has always been, though, to look at issues, and these issues are universal. I like to say that we've always take uh, look. We've always seen the extraordinary in the everyday. So, for example, uh, one of our first exhibitions was called the Rat. Why? Because there was a rat infestation, and the museum decided to use this in, this problem as a vehicle to talk to people in the community about you know how they felt about it, what could they do about it. So it was both health oriented. It also got into you know the the uh, animal side of rats and rodents and all of that. And so our exhibitions typically. Uh, whether we were doing, uh, most recently, uh, a couple of years ago, we did an exhibition called Banding Together, School Bands as Instruments of Opportunity. And we traced uh, the history of instrumental music bands uh, 150 years back in Washington, D.C., from cadet bands to where they had sort of evolved to the... Uh, the, the, the bands that you see, you know, at uh, African-American colleges. And we talked about how important music programming is to uh, community. So that has always been the approach of the museums. It's, it's often issue oriented. It's often, we're often celebrating something or we're looking at a, a, a creative way that a problem has been approached. And, um, and we maintain that uh, approach in our research. Um, our mission sort of changing exhibition was one focusing on the Anacostia River called Reclaiming the Edge, Urban Waterways and Civic Engagement. Using the Anacostia, which is where we are, as a microcosm, we looked at the problems there, and then we looked at five other communities locally, nationally, and internationally, and, uh, and began to, and looked at environmental issues, cultural issues, you know, um, the river in music, the river in poetry. That's the way that the museum has, has evolved and how we have that direct contact to people. So do you, you have curators who uh, come up with this programming? Are they living in these communities and uh, uh, or are you surveying your right. communities in some mm -hmm. way and then... Uh, we do it through a number of different ways. Our, the, the, there are two divisions, major divisions in the museum. Um, one is uh, collections, research, and exhibitions. So that is the group that uh, sort of looks at the topics and comes up with many of the topics that will be research focused and then whether or not we're going to um, distribute the information through an exhibition or we're going to publish a book or we're going to do it through programming. Uh, if it's through programming, our public programming uh, uh, division develops programming to support both exhibitions and to also support the, the general focus of the museum. We're looking at things like housing, gentrification. Um, we're looking at art and culture in the community, um, environmental issues, history, community history. So those are areas that are supported by the research that's done, you know, by the uh, curators, and then is manifest in the variety of programs that we do. And a large part of that is music, and uh, much of our uh, uh, programming in jazz music, our, our Metro Mambo series looks at salsa music. Um, you know, we incorporate art and culture in our work, which is primarily history and culture. So I'm going to jump over to Ken for a minute because of the uh, Smithsonian connection here and ask you, Ken, uh, how does, um, is there interaction between the, the History Museum uh, and the large uh, collections with the uh, Community Museum in Anacostia and the other Smithsonian affiliates that are all over the country. Are you aware of that kind of uh, networking? Well, yeah. I mean, that's naturally what we do. I mean, one, one obvious vehicle as we're approaching it is Jazz Appreciation Month, where we do programming, marketing, um, support. Um, so that is something that is, is created a focus that has brought the community in Washington and beyond because it is a national and international effort there to think about how one we can serve these communities by providing resources that we might have sometimes it's financial uh, sometimes in this particular uh, in, in, a, in a 
common and consistent way, we do provide uh, access to a poster that helps brand it. Uh, we also use our website as a vehicle to then um, educate audiences what's happening around the country. Um, also, various uh, methods that one might choose to help to to celebrate this moment and various vehicles to go about doing it and locations. And so it's a it's really it's it's a it's a dialogue. It's not a monologue. Monologue. It's a dialogue. So it helps us understand what the communities need because not every every community is unique, and you can't just uh, prescribe what you think is going to work. You have to be able. You have to stop and listen and figure out. Okay, how can we assist? What do we have at our grasp that will help you? As in for affiliates, um, the same similar thing. We have. Uh, over 178 plus affiliates around the country, and they really know their community best. And so we try to provide them, first thing, a snapshot into what we have, be it either collections, scholarship, um, uh, ex exhibitions, be it online exhibitions, uh, access to collections, because these um, affiliates also borrow collections. And so they'll look at what particular objects they might use and borrow that has resonance within their community and then use it as a springboard for public programming. Uh, so it's very rich and it works, like I said, in, in, in both ways because we tend to then gain a greater insight into the historical content and uniqueness of these communities that then allow us to go in there and help document it um, as per se through these oral history interviews or um, provide any other particular support material that will help them in their efforts and, and um, so celebrating jazz, but also um, I, recognizing the unique um, position that they have in their community and those artists and those who, who really have made a difference. You know, I want, I want to ask a, a kind of a general question here. How do we define community? How does the muse a museum uh, define community? And maybe, Michael, you, you have the most immediate, it would seem, uh, definition uh, for a community. You are so situated within a neighborhood. Is that what communities are, neighborhoods? Well, I think it's a terrific question. There are different levels of community, and when I think of community, I think of the Armstrong community or Armstrong family, and they are, and this is explicit in our mission statement, they are all ages, all nationalities, all locations. Uh, it's, we have people from all over the world that walk in our door every day. Uh, it's not unusual for us to have one tour of uh, second graders from Queens and the following tour has people from Japan and Germany and uh, Colombia all on the same tour. So in one sense that's community or Armstrong community or Armstrong family. But yes, there's another way to look at community and that is our geographical community, our neighborhood. And that's something uh, that we're very engaged in. You mentioned Louis Armstrong's love of his neighborhood, and that's very, very true. I mean, he loved Corona. He continued to live there in a very modest house. Uh, he used to go two blocks up and one block over to the local barber shop and wait his turn in line and get his hair cut. Uh, when the band bus would bring Louis home from a tour, kids from the block would greet the bus help Lewis carry in his suitcases and his trumpet case. Lucille would fix everybody a bowl of ice cream and they'd watch westerns on TV, you know. So that's our community and we continue to keep that tradition working with our community. At one time, Lucille talked Lewis into looking at a townhouse in Manhattan and they got in the car, they drove into Manhattan, they parked, they got out of the car, he was mobbed by autograph seekers. Now, he loved his fans. He very happily signed every autograph. But after he signed the last autograph, he turned to Lucille. He said, get back in the car. We're going <laughs> home. And they went back to Corona. And, and so that's where they live for, for their lifetimes. Here's how we engage that community. One way, for the last 27 years, every spring we have children's jazz concerts in the beautiful garden of the Armstrong House. We call it Pops' is Tops, and we bring in world-class jazz artists, John Faddis, Ray Vega and the Latin Jazz Sextet, Roy Hargrove. We bring in world-class artists, and they play for kids from Lewis's neighborhood. We can see 250 kids a show. We do two shows a day over three days. And it's not just a concert. 
the musicians explain how jazz works, how their instruments are played, this is what the bass does, this is what the drum does, and uh, it's great. It's a fabulous program, and we've been doing that for 27 years for kids in our community. And that's so important because in jazz in general, we have to build new audiences. One of our core constituencies is the, forgive me to my audience, the white-haired 78 collectors, you know. They're great. They love us. They're going to come. we got to reach the kids in our community. Uh, another thing we do just for uh, specifically for our immediate neighborhood, we have an Easter egg hunt every Easter, and we have a, uh, we have a Halloween costume contest. Louie's neighborhood, like all neighborhoods in New York, they're always changing. Uh, 20 years ago, our block was comprised of African-American homeowners. Now, it's mostly Spanish-speaking people who self-identified by nationality. They're from Colombia or Ecuador or Dominican Republic. And so, uh, to give you an example, we have an Easter egg hunt. It's packed. We had 270 kids last year at our Easter egg hunt. And for many of these children and their families who are from Central America, South America, Easter bunnies and Easter eggs are not part of their heritage, but they're embracing it. They love it. They have the greatest time. So that's another way that we, uh, we reach out to our very immediate community to make sure that, yes, I have people coming from Japan on the tour, but I want to make sure people from 106th Street also know about the museum and come to the museum and are welcome in the museum. Uh, Ken, is the uh, American History Museum that grassroots and that, you know, you, being basically on the mall, you don't have a uh, residential uh, right around you, and you're considered like America's attic, right? I mean, this is the, this is, these are the collections. How do you sustain a, uh, a direct relationship with what we would call grassroots communities? Well, that's a great question there. Um, <clears throat> yes, we, we, as we are strategically located on the mall, uh, it does provide a little bit of a challenge for connecting with communities. And so, in that sense, we actually go out into the communities and, and uh, um, into their um, region so that, that we can bridge that gap. Um, we do get, at the museum, over 5 million visitors a year. But it, when we looked at it and did uh, surveys, you can tell that a lot of the audience are definitely first-time visitors, out-of-state out visitors. And so, uh, like any, any place, if you live there, you're, it's kind of one of the last places that you think to go. Um, so we recognized that many years ago. And so well, actually, when the uh, Historic Lincoln Theater came back online again in 94, after it was uh, had closed for renovation, we made it a concerted effort, which is on the historic U Street corridor there, to go and uh, present uh, um, part of our concert series at the theater, U Street Theater, uh, Lincoln Theater, I mean. And so we find that that is a critical part of our mission, is not necessarily relying upon uh, our audiences come to us. We also have the benefit that within the orchestra itself, um, the musicians are, are, well, here we go, the word again, community members. So you have our artistic director, which is Charlie Young, who is a professor at Howard University, uh, and so we, we by design, make sure that our musicians um, are, are thinking beyond just the walls of the performance venue when they come and perform, but they actually are our are, are troops on the ground. So it's, it's a real, it's, it is a concerted effort there, and it can be problematic if you're relying upon everybody to come to you. You're, you're not going to do the job that, sh at least I'm not going to do the job that I've been entrusted to, which is really develop and, uh, and enhance and grow our audience base. And um, that's, that's how we have to do it uh, based upon the location that we are at on the mall. Uh, if, Marshall, let me ask you. Did, I, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to add one more comment before we move off the topic of community. Because We're not going to move off it. <laughs> well, I mean, to, to, to build upon this. Because it's, it's very important to us, and it's been very successful to us. And that is uh, the Louis Armstrong House Museum, uh, years ago, before the house was restored and opened to the public, formed an advisory board. And the advisory board has many community members, has local elected officials, has block residents, 
as prominent jazz people from our neighborhood. Uh, as some of you know, uh, many great jazz musicians lived in Queens. I mean, Jimmy Heath lives down the street. He's on our advisory board. Dizzy Gillespie used to live a block away from Lewis. So this advisory board uh, uh, did a number of things for us, but one of the most important, it gave our community a voice in planning the museum and the programs and the concerns. What about parking? What about this? What about that? So the advisory board has been tremendously successful. It's vibrant and, and, and it's active, and it's been a great success with building those connections between community and the museum. Marsha, does the Anikowski yeah. Museum? Yeah, well, actually, one? one of the things that I think is really great about the Smithsonian family, um, as I like to call us affectionately, I say we're the Smithsonian in the hood, in the neighborhood. Okay, so because all the other museums are on the mall. However, we collaborate, and um, one of the things that um, I thought Kenneth was going to mention, especially during uh, Jazz Appreciation Month, um, our programmers um, are part of that larger uh, jazz schedule, uh, uh, performance schedule, uh, in the Howard University Orchestra has uh, performed down at the uh, at the Portrait Gallery. It's a program that we put together, uh, and we communicate with the with the neighborhood and the community through an e calendar that I put out that anyone can um, can uh, subscribe to. Go to our uh, website and just click on the subscription button, and it goes out to anyone who's interested. It is a way to, on a monthly basis, know what we're doing. Um, we also uh, develop programming that, as I said, it, it looks at all aspects of the history. So music is a part, but is not the only focus of, of our, um, of, of the museum's work. And um, of course, uh, we're always looking for opportunities and we do it through our collections to augment our exhibitions. Now, one thing that would you'd notice when you come to visit us uh, in Anacostia is that we have revolving exhibitions. We do not have pr uh, permanent exhibitions because we have a smaller space. So we are constantly bringing new topics um, and and that gives us the opportunity to kind of keep our, our information fresh. We capture people on a number of different levels but when they come to the museum they learn about all of the other inroads. We have a museum academy which is a program that has been um, has been uh, in place for over ten years, where we actually um, are linked with a public school, an elementary school, and the kids uh, come to the museum and uh, look at whatever exhibition is up. They do projects around the exhibition, and it's an after-school program, and it also has a component, a, commu a, uh, uh, a career day component, where we bring middle school students through. Uh, we do community forums on topics of interest. So, for example, our last exhibition was on the river, so we did environmental forums, looking at what was going on with the Anacostia River as well as other rivers, because as I said, that exhibition focused on uh, a river in China, in London, in Ohio, the L.A. River. It, you know, so, we, so it's a broad perspective that, that we, we also look at. With our music program, We've been really uh, delighted through uh, this this uh, rhythm cafe program that we do, which is a lecture demonstration, and we focused on jazz greats. Had local musicians perform to to you know the music of jazz greats, um, Carmen McRae, uh, Horace Silver, you know just and so that's another way we approach it. And then of course we are our community is also undergoing change, and so. It's moving from being an, a, 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 a completely African-American community as other people are moving in. Uh, we have a Latino influence, and so Metro Mambo looks at the Latin influence in D.C., both from a historical standpoint and a current standpoint, and we collaborate with a lot of organizations. Metro Mambo is a really wonderful collaboration with WPFW Radio, and the, and the DJs, um, Many of the uh, DJs uh, who are interested, you know, bring their interest and their guests uh, uh, assist us in the programming, and they also publicize uh, the program. So um, 
we're able to do that, I think, quite, you know, pretty well at the Smithsonian, and we, as an organization, borrow from each other and and have each other support the different programming that that we have. And and you know what, this is, as I always say, your tax dollars at work. The Smithsonian is a federally funded organization, and so you know, this is something that we can make available across across the board. You've mentioned this, and Michael also just wrote a comment um, to, a, to a question he sees in our chat box. I, uh, panelists, I don't think that the attendees can see what you're writing in the chat boxes. So let me just repeat this question, which was a comment from Glenn White, and he said, uh, are any of the organizations doing anything to bring visibility to emerging or uh, developing artists? And Marsha, you've said, just explained how that happens working in a uh, relationship with uh, partnering with with organizations or bringing uh, I guess young musicians in to play the music of the older musicians and Michael you wrote something here about LAHM, oh Louis Armstrong House Museum <laughs> Hot Jazz Cool Garden Program of Summer Concerts specifically showcases emerging artists but is this part of the responsibility of of museums in general today um, not to be uh, repositories of classic works, but to uh, be welcoming uh, locations for people who want to work in the arts. Is that part of the considered part of the mission for museums in general? Is that a, a thought in the field? I think that it really is. Uh, the Smithsonian um, has just uh, initiated a, a new branding. We are in a new branding program. Uh, seriously amazing is our t is the tag for the entire Smithsonian. And and one of the things that the Smithsonian looked at as a whole was was the need to get away from the idea of being that rusty, dusty attic, but to show how many how people can take advantage of the Smithsonian and how the Smithsonian provides. Um, all kinds of services through making connections, uh, you know, among different types of people on topics that they're interested in in doing research. And we certainly that that is pretty much the the the, the genesis of the Anacostia Community Museum. That is where we've been. That's what we've been focusing on. As I like to say, we see the extraordinary in the everyday. And so we're looking at, um, you know, what's going on in the community, whether it's the physical community or people are all coming together around a particular idea or a particular movement. Whatever brings people together is is what we're focusing on. And then you you, what's really cool, and and museums can do this is you can look back in history. We can look back in history, and we can look at examples and draw from examples in history as to how different communities based on those three definitions I gave have approached a particular issue or a particular problem or, or, or what are the commonalities. We can do that. So that's how you kind of bridge the gap between I guess what's practical application and you know what's of historical significance. Ken, is this more difficult for the, the largest institution of the Smithsonian? Um. Well, uh, there are always there are always always are challenges when you have a a large institution that has to be able to move on a dime. So it takes a little more effort there to do that. Um, I, there is a, a re realization these days that the traditional museum uh, model is not effective in its younger audiences, and so uh, the institution across the board has learned from. Um, itself and partners outside that um, we need to be more responsive and connect to our audiences in a way that that uh, gets them to feel connected and invested in what we're doing and also have a voice because I think that's a big thing right now is that traditionally you come in you see something you you learn about it but you don't necessarily see yourself as part of it you know mm -hmm. something and now it's really more and more we're looking to to hear those voices uh, coming in and tell us about themselves so that we can also have that discovery. Um, so is that door open? I mean, people can reach you or can reach other uh, um, officers at the museum and, and, and make their voices heard and there's a channels for those ideas going, um, uh, getting to you? 
Yeah, I think Marsha had said it really beautifully is that, you know, we're in public trust. And so I, that was instilled in me early on that I, I'm not somebody that hides behind, like Oz, behind the magic, you know, curtain there. I, I'm, I'm in to be accessible when somebody reaches out to me. Uh, I'm required to be responsive, and I take it very seriously. And so no matter who it is and what the question is, and uh, it allows um, us to be more proactive and vibrant and responsive. And it's a good thing. You know, it's it's a good thing to do that because of it, it puts things in perspective of where we are right now, and, and it's not just us being the only authoritative voice, but there are many of voices within within the story, American history story that 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 we um, cherish and and learn from. So it's a it's a very interesting place and time to be in right now because this model is in, is changing right in front of our eyes, and with the museum going through its um, renovation of the West Wing, um, there is a lot of discussion and conversation about how to do that uh, because once you build that infrastructure, once you build it, it's up for a period of time and we don't want it to be stagnant. We want to find, how, find a way to keep it so that it's vibrant and that it stimulates conversations for years to come. It has an opportunity for inclusiveness and we all can learn from it. If I can, I want to give an example of how this can kind of happen and how it can kind of go from a microcosm to a broader um, outlook. Uh, one, the museum, the Anacostia, got, uh, one of our areas of focus, of course, is the Anacostia community. And one of our concerns was community and creativity. So our curators began this project called Just That, Community and, and, and Creativity. And it first started out with uh, featuring an artist who made some very amazing, his work was amazing. He's from the metropolitan area. And he's a sculptor with found, I guess you'd call it found objects, contemporary work, amazing. And then we, we did a, we, that was the first exhibition. The second exhibition that we did looked at a photographer and, um, and, and also a very young company that did animation work to show the diversity in the community. The third exhibition was not an exhibition at all. We collaborated with the Smithsonian Folklife Festival on the Mall, and we did a program called Cityfied, um, Arts and Creativity East of the Anacostia River, and we looked at non-traditional arts. We looked at tattoo artists, and, and we looked at uh, hip-hop. We looked at Go Go, which you know is a is a distinctly uh, DC uh, music. We we looked at quilters, line dancers, and this all occurred on the National Mall. And I must point out that it was unfortunately during the time we lost um, uh, Chuck Brown, uh, uh, but we also did uh, a memorial to him on the hottest day of the year. It was 109 degrees, but it was wonderful. And so m many of the, the, the comments that we got uh, and the festival got was that these were things that you wouldn't normally see celebrated, but they're out of the community, the tattoo artist. We had a tattoo artist, we had muralist. And so, you know, that's a way that we can sort of uh, show people that things that everyday things that you do and you take for granted are significant and important and 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 the museum is a place that because of its scholarship and the ability to 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 bring that and its collections can actually support this in a in a very very strong way for for people who are not um, knowledgeable about DC go go uh, at all they should know that Chuck Brown is the founder of basically that's called the epitome of of go go music Michael, um, let me ask you, are you aware of other uh, house museums around the country, uh, institutions that are taking on the model that the Louis, Ar Louis Armstrong House Museum has uh, established? Seems like such a great idea, you know. We have these, these iconic musicians. Uh, oftentimes there's some uh, desire to uh, preserve their homes. I'm thinking about the John Coltrane House houses, one in Long Island and one in Philadelphia, and couldn't these be community centers? Couldn't they be active and, as Marcia said, research and, and uh, uh, reflective of the values and also the values of the uh, locality? You, well, you see that happening elsewhere? 
Well, Louis Armstrong's house is unique in the jazz world. Uh, he lived in the house for decades, from 1943 on, and he was a pack rat. I mean, this treasure trove of material was discovered in the house, and he had so many ties to the community, and Lewis is such a giant in the history of the music. I mean, one of the greatest musicians, not only in 20th century American music, but in any century, any music. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's wonderful and appropriate that his house is a historic house museum. Where else? There's nothing else like it in the jazz world. I mean, Duke Ellington had, had different houses. Um, you mentioned the Coltrane houses, the Coltrane house in Dix Hills, Long Island. Uh, John and Alice lived there. John lived there the last three years of his life. Now, they were significant years. That's when a Love Supreme, uh, mm -hmm. he composed a Love Supreme in the house. But he was there for only three years. And other people have lived in the house since then. So there are efforts underway to open that house as a museum, but it's a longer road. And, and I want it to happen. I've consulted with the Coltrane House uh, board and supporters, and not for money, but because I deeply admire John Coltrane as a musician and as a person and would love to see it happen. But it's a longer road because they're not starting where we were with the Armstrong House. Same with Cousin Mary's house in Philadelphia. I mean, there have been changes to the house over the years. The artifacts in it are not original. So it's a taller order to make it happen. Um, there is a W.C. Handy uh, uh, historic house, uh, but that's a recreation of his birthplace. It's a, my understanding is it's a recreation of the log cabin he was born in. So, you know, what else is there in the jazz world? It's a shame. Uh, mm -hmm. I love New Orleans. I'm in New Orleans a lot because of the Armstrong Festival uh, every August, Satchmo Summerfest, and because my brother lives in New Orleans. And uh, New Orleans has lost so much historic fabric. I took a jazz tour of New Orleans many years ago. I happen to know the guy who gave the tour, and it was sort of an imaginary tour. Over here used to be this house. Over here used to be this nightclub. And it's sad that that's happening in the United States. But uh, the, Armstrong house, the Armstrong house is unique. Uh, we're all grateful that it's happened, and I hope, I hope that it happens for other sites and other locations. But it, it's a tall order. It's a big job, eh? Should, what if there are um, musicians today who are looking to their legacy and thinking about how to establish, uh, uh, like, the presidential libraries for themselves mm -hmm. you know, on a smaller scale? Is that something that um, is feasible in some sort of way that, that communities could get around I mean, I'm thinking of Von Freeman in Chicago, for instance, who had a large uh, community impact. Would uh, his brothers who were surviving him uh, be able to uh, find funding, perhaps, to um, uh, establish it, again, as a community center, if not a, a, a repository of his personal effects? Would that be something that is at all viable? Oh, it's it's already happening for some. There's a fabulous Dave Brubeck collection out at the University of the Pacific, I believe it is, and uh, you know, monumental. They have have tremendous stuff. There's a Lionel Hampton collection. I think it's University of Idaho. Forgive me if I'm saying these wrong. And so it is happening. And and musicians, if they have the forethought, could make that happen. Absolutely, and it, it would be welcome. I mean, these materials, they're this is material culture, and it's priceless, and it needs to be in a place where it can be preserved and made available to today's generation and future generations. May I add something into that? <clears throat> is that yeah. what Michael hit on there? Is that it's um, to start from scratch? Uh -huh. the, it's a pretty daunting, daunting task to take on um, when you have institutions already in place. That have a sense of of their of this cultural heritage and the the need to not just to uh, preserve and catalog it, but also make it accessible. Um, uh, Brubeck Institute does that. Um, various other institutions. That's that that can work as a benefit. <clears throat> the um, the donor just needs to have a pure, a really a, a, an understanding about what they're hoping to get out of this. What what's what is what they see to be most um, valuable for their collection 
uh, to be at this particular location? And my answer, one of my, my most immediate answers is um, accessibility. If anybody's legacy uh, will continue to have vibrancy based upon accessibility, if it goes to a place where basically it is a select few that have access to it, that legacy will continue to diminish and it won't serve the greater audience. And so those are, those are critical, There's, that's one of those critical questions that need to be asked. To start from scratch, once you start going down that, that rat hole, you start to figure out, wow, this is really a daunting task. You have to have a community support behind it. You have to have really financial support. You've got to have long-term vision uh, about how to sustain this. Yeah, uh, you know, I, to, to speak to that issue, one of the things that we do and we've been doing um, for many years is uh, helping people in the community preserve what they have doing workshops on how to preserve the important items you have. Now obviously we're always looking to build our collection and so sometimes people decide that uh, you know at, that they want to turn it over to an institution that they know will make this, inf this information or these objects available to the public. Um, I think that uh, it's really great to have institutions that focus in on a particular subject because I think that when you have a house museum and you walk in there and you feel Louis Armstrong's, for example, presence, like we have the Frederick Douglass house uh, in Anacostia, there's, that's significant. There's nothing that can, I think, can replace that. But I think what needs to be weighed is, and for every organization that's able to successfully do it, as, as Louis Armstrong Museum has been able to do it, I mean, that's amazing. But it is a bit of a daunting task. Not everyone, not everyone who wants to do this type of thing is going to be able to, because you've got to be able to make sure that the artifacts are well preserved, you know, that, and, that, and, and that they um, can be presented, and you have to have the financial wherewithal. I mean, it's really all about the financial wherewithal to do this. So, I mean, it's wonderful for, to have all these alternatives, but I think that that's probably um, one of the issues that any person or organization that seeks to create their own museum has to consider is longevity and being able to preserve the very artifacts that they want to, you know, highlight and present. Well, Mar Marcia, I, I thank you for bringing that up. Let me add a, a, a footnote to that for the Armstrong Museum. Uh, the stars lined up in a certain way for this to happen, and one of the factors was uh, the Louis Armstrong Estate, which is administered by a private foundation called the Louis Armstrong Educational Foundation. Mm -hmm. the, educational found the Educational Foundation, after Louis and eventually Lucille passed, they had the decision to make what's going to happen to this house, what's going to happen to the contents of this house. And they gave the contents to Queens College. I'm a Queens College employee. And they gave the house, this was under Lucille's will, to the city of New York and arranged for Queens College to administer it under a long-term license agreement. So I'm speaking to what you just said. We had that institutional support. We had Queens College, the City University of New York behind us. We had the Armstrong Foundation who gives us an annual grant for general operating support. Without, without those, those legs on the stool of, of the City University and the Armstrong Foundation and government support, uh, we wouldn't be able to do what we do at all. That, that has to be in place. Yeah. But uh, for the purposes of you know, um, advancing jazz itself, I mean, I think all of us agree that uh, this is, we want it to be a living art form. We don't want it to seem frozen in time or to be something that is uh, looked at through a only historical context. So I have a comment from uh, the Seattle Arts Museum gentleman or, or lady, I'm not sure which. The museum could be considered a dangerous place for jazz as it may frame it in the public's mind as a purely historical context. There may also be a certain perceived inaccessibility that sets in with the audience expectation of a serious evening rather than one filled with vibrancy of the changing art form. So, I mean, I think um, when the Smithsonian Masterworks Jazz Orchestra goes out, uh, you're trying to show that this is a living art form, Ken, and you're uh, not only playing uh, masterworks from the 20s and 30s, correct? Are you also doing uh, uh, workshops with um, local musicians and uh, inviting them even just for... Uh, 
socializing, socializing with the musicians and things like that? We, we really do it all. I mean, our, our, our basis is, of course, um, taking from the, those masterpieces or those masters. I mean, that's our foundation. Uh, and um, it gives us something to work from. Um, but we also, through the many years, have realized that there's masters still with us and that we shouldn't exclude them from uh, providing uh, and ad re ad requesting for uh, commissions. Um, so that there, when I first came to the museum, there was this sense of 25-year temporal distance that we wouldn't look at any music, and that had changed because of the fact, once again, that it it's, was silly to not benefit from these masters while they're still alive. How we extend it and keep it vibrant, uh, we do uh, workshops, we have jam sessions, we have actually young uh, performance ensembles that either perform at the museum or we're more on the road. Um, this past November, we were in Nairobi, Kenya, and we did a whole host of workshops and jam sessions with uh, musicians over there. So it's, it is, it, and, and it's not and this is the, it is the dangerous thing, because there is that notion that you got to put on white gloves and treat it with that kind of care. We take the white gloves off. I mean, it is a living breathing. We do uh, instruct, or at least we provide uh, an understanding to our musicians that when we're playing certain music based upon a certain historical language, we need to play within that language, but don't lose yourself. Still be yourself. Because if you, if you change who you are to conform to a specific person of that particular time, uh, the music won't have that opportunity to come alive. So it really is us having the, the, the knowledge and foundation within the music we're playing to bring it alive and then extend it to young audiences and have them um, respond back to us to figure out what, what it means to them and then continue that dialogue. So it, it isn't the concern of it being in a museum and it's the, the stodginess or the, the, um, the approach of it not coming to life is really not um, even a, uh, uh, a point of concern of where we come from. Yeah. Let me ask you as a follow-up about the oral history project in that way. It's often seemed to me that uh, you're going to get one interview if you talk to musicians who's in his 60s or 70s or 80s or woman who's in her 60s, 70s, or 80s. But you get a very different sense of what the musician's life is like, what their concerns are, if you're talking to people who are in their 20s and 30s. And, you know, I've often wondered if there's a possibility to do, we can't identify who the masters are necessarily when they're in their 20s or 30s. But shouldn't oral history uh, be opened up to deal with uh, people who are in their, in their salad days? Sure. I mean, we. one of the things that is very, very exciting to me, at least in, in terms of the uh, music world and the jazz world particularly, is the opportunity to have intergenerational conversations and to have, um, and, and that's what we do in our programs that we do on site at the museum or, or in the surrounding communities, um, you have an opportunity where one can teach the other. I've been in settings where, you know, you have younger performers uh, 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 doing a performance and there are older musicians there who are very impressed by what younger folks are doing and the direction in which they're taking the music. I think that uh, that's the history of jazz. Jazz is a, is a language that is intergenerational and you know it 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 talks about people's experiences wherever those those human experiences uh, you know so I think that that I'm excited that I'm seeing a lot more opportunity for that to happen and at our museum um, it is very impressive how many young people come to our performances because we're we're teaching but it's but it's it's also an opportunity to to offer some exchange and and I think that that's I, I think that bodes very well for um, the relationship between jazz and the community and where museums can intersect you know and, and help to to uh, pretty much make that connection I think we have I think there's an important role that we can we can play in that regard well, if you make the museum seem so accessible and so welcoming, it would seem like you would have people from the community saying, you know, we want to put on a show there. We have an exhibit that we would like to. How, what are the best ways for people who have those impulses to reach all three of you 
with their ideas and to, to see if they can develop a, uh, an exhibition or performance uh, program of some sort that's coming from the community and that, the, that can be embraced by the institution. We actually have community scholars, our community curators. Um, because of the, our focus now, which is broadened, um, when we did our, our, uh, our Gullah exhibit, we had a scholar working along with um, uh, members from the Geechee Gullah community developing the exhibition. And that model um, is, is really one that we use for many of our exhibitions, in addition to the ones that are just, you know, scholarly uh, uh, driven. So what one would do is get in contact with the museum and speak to our, our curatorial group and bring forth an idea, if they have it, you know, that, that they, they think might work out. And so we'd see whether this was something that was possible, you know, for us to do. Do we have the artifacts to support it or can we get the artifacts to support it? Can we get the underwriting to do it? But the process, you know, starts in, in, in that way. Michael, how far in advance do you uh, determine programming for a year? You already know what the exhibitions are going to be for next fall, I would think. You're asking me? I'm sorry I didn't hear you. Yeah. How far in advance yeah. do you uh, determine programming? Uh, we try to, we're working on, having a five-year calendar. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a great admirer of Michael Kaiser of the Kennedy Center and his arts management initiatives and uh, that's what he recommends and it makes a lot of sense because then you can really look ahead and you can see the anniversaries and you can match funders to programming uh, in a smart way and so that's what we try to do. We have it written in stone for about a year and we've added things at the last minute. Sure, we're, we're flexible. But, but back to programming and especially some of the conversation we've had this evening about presenting. I mean, the Armstrong House puts on great concerts, but we're not first and foremost a performing arts presenter. I mean, our program really is the tour through Lewis's house, and you get to know Lewis by coming to his house. One of the neat things about the house is discovered in the house were 700 home recorded tapes and we installed a hidden audio system. As you go through the house, you hear Lewis at home. You hear Lewis playing with a family dog and practicing his trumpet and telling jokes and band stories and eating dinner, and it makes the house come alive. So everybody can get that, no matter what their age, no matter where they're coming from. Uh, the same for, uh, in a great part with the research collections. But to the performing arts presenting part of it, of course, it's focused on Louis Armstrong. We're the Louis Armstrong house, but we're open to all sorts of music. We've had Dominican dancers in the garden. Uh, we've had hip hop groups. Uh, I contracted uh, some time back with a, a well-known turntablist to scratch Louis Armstrong records. It didn't materialize, oh. but I hope it's going to happen very soon. That's so, you know, cool. American mm -hmm. music is a continuum. So let's let's embrace it all. You know, there are only two types of music, good and bad. Well, sometimes you've also been able to partner with, like, the Langston Hughes Library, for instance, nearby, for uh, to open this up to the community further. As oh, absolutely. The, the Langston Hughes Community Library and Cultural Center is a sister organization, and we collaborate all the time on, on programs and events. Are partnerships with uh, jazz education groups or perhaps the Jazz Foundation of America or, I don't know, uh, uh, the, the uh, DC Jazz Festival, are these also important aspects of, of your work? Partnerships like that. Um, absolutely, absolutely. We collaborate. We uh, we obviously do programs during uh, Jazz Appreciation Month. We also do. Um, we work with the um, Washington area Women of Jazz during Women's uh, uh, Appreciation Month, and so we're able to pepper music programs throughout the year. But to give you an, another approach, which is sort of an interesting way to look at it. Our current exhibition is called A Buchle, uh, Beadwork and the Art of Independence. And it's a fabulous exhibition which is looking at the work of South African women artists 
post-apartheid who you know have found a way to elevate a traditional beading work into works of art and so through this exhibition and all the and all of the programming around it we're also looking at music so that also allows us to look at contemporary South African music which is like amazing and there's, there's South African jazz and so that we, we have that ability to kind of come full through in our programming and offer other types of you know um, of information you know to broaden the information and broaden the platform and take it uh, internationally and then bring it back locally what would be totally cool of course is to be able to do a cross-cultural you know music thing jazz thing and any funders out there who are interested in that uh, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be happy to talk to them after the program <laughs> but I mean that's the kind of thing that we you know can do but I bring up the funding issue because that is always you know at the base I think of, of, of how one goes forward with this and, and is a consideration but but we at least are able we, we are one of the we are the smallest museum at the Smithsonian but our out our outlook is quite is quite broad since you mentioned the funding issue, I want to take a moment to uh, uh, thank our the sponsors of the Talking Jazz series and uh, say that you are uh, attendees to this uh, panel discussion. You're enjoying Talking Jazz, which is presented by the Jazz Journalists Association, thanks to the generous support of the Jazz Cruise as part of the Anita E. Berry Jazz Education Fund with further support from Century Media Partners. And so let's shift, and also, uh, at this point, folks, if you have questions, please feel free to uh, type them into the chat box, um, and I will try to convey those to the panelists in a way that doesn't completely disrupt the conversation. Um, Ken, I want to get back to uh, the issue about uh, Jazz Appreciation Month and what the Smithsonian um, sees as its outreach uh, for this coming April. Um, the Jazz Journals Association calls it Jazz April, which encompasses both Jazz Appreciation Month and also International Jazz Day, and we have a lot of ideas about uh, programming that can be done on a local basis. But please, let's let's talk about what Smithsonian does with that. Sure. Well, Marsha, Marsha, please also chime in because this is a it's really a Smithsonian effort there. Yeah. Um, so um, and Michael what, can talk to. <laughs> what we. Um, Every year we, we look at a, a prior to that year that April we look at um, moments of great celebration um, collections that we can use to support it uh, some historic event there that might help um, uh, elevate and um, be a point of interest for not just the stakeholders the jazz stakeholders but actually for a broader audience and uh, its lasting impact be it uh, the iconic individual, the music that maybe they composed, or whatever it may be. And so this year, um, we recognize that, uh, and it so happens that it's actually in December of this year, but we recognize that um, it is the 50th anniversary of A Love Supreme, John Coltrane's recording mm -hmm. and writing Love Supreme. And the museum so happens to have that historic score as part of its collection, which will be on display uh, in uh, mid mid March, all the way through April. So it becomes a it becomes a, 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 a an op opportunity for a lot of people to hang their hat on. I did a little research just to see its impact and its continued impact. It's kind of interesting to see that those who might not associate with jazz um, have cited this particular recording as a point of inspiration many years after it was recorded. Phil Lesh being one of those who was the basis with Grateful Dead, and it goes on. So it, it, it said to us that we're, in this particular case, that we're in the right direction because we wanted to have a larger impact uh, in the community. So with that being said, we also went through the, 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 um, the collections around the institution to find if there was any artwork that would uh, allow us to present it on our annual poster. And it so happens that there's a wonderful poster uh, I would hold it up, and I think it probably wouldn't be framed well in this this uh, this web conference here. Uh, but it's a uh, Joseph. Um, Let's see it. Let's see it. Holston. So we can see a little bit of it here. Just a tad bit here. 
that we give away for free. We actually combination we print out uh, up to about 150,000 of them, but that doesn't necessarily serve all of our audience. But we also do a PDF so that one can download it and also take advantage of the fact that this poster is available. Um, it's a great way to help create a focus there. It doesn't have to be Coltrane. It can be just anything under the, the umbrella of Jazz Appreciation Month. So we use that as a, as a, as a launching opportunity, and we provide, like I said earlier, opportunities to help market or uh, make uh, those various communities around the country aware of this moment as it's uh, in play. April is a, I say, I say this because I'm, I'm actually in the, the um, not jazz, April's not the only month that I celebrate jazz, it's 365 days a year for me and I know that we all do that, but this happens to be a really critical time and a lot of the stars align because you have school programs that can participate as towards the end of the school year, there's spring break. They can work towards this moment within their their um, uh, bands, and there's a lot of things that can come out of this based upon this particular time of the month. And we we have been a uh, constantly reaching out to help those who are trying to find ways to celebrate and to recognize the fact that this is a uniquely American art form. Absolutely. And if I can just um, say specifically, uh, you know, soon I know that the um, the Smithsonian um, Jazz Appreciation Month uh, website and page will be up, and we have several programs. We start off in March also. Uh, our Rhythm Cafe program, we're doing a, a, a bebop uh, redo, and, and there we'll be focusing on the life of um, bebop jazz vocalist Anita O'Day. And we collaborate a lot with Howard University, my alma mater. <laughs> but and and, uh, and so we have Howard University students who are involved in a lot of our program, and that's how again how we make the connection. And it's not only Howard; it's you know all of the um, schools across the district. Uh, so in March we have a program on the 23rd, and in April for Jam we're going to be focusing on the life and music of Thel Thelonious Monk and uh, Monk and Ornette Co uh, Coleman. And we'll be doing that at the Portrait Gallery. Again, that's a collaboration, and also um, with our our uh, continuing our collaboration with WPFW, um, the uh, one of the DJs there, uh, uh, Willard Jenkins, will be presenting the dis discussion. So we always do a lecture and then a performance format. That's how we usually do our programming, and then. Um, one of my personal favorites, uh, April 27th, Rhythm Cafe will be presenting uh, the life and the music of Sassy Sarah Vaughan. And, um, and so that should be, you know, again, it's going to be a discussion of her life and her career. And then um, and a, a Brooklyn native, uh, Barbara King, will be performing. And that's what we're doing at the museum. So we do programming on site at the museum, and then we also collaborate with, um, you know, uh, the Museum of American History or the Portrait Gallery and do programming in other places also. And so it's, it's, it's really a, a wonderful opportunity. Is there any uh, uh, opportunity for um, the museums to... Um Disseminate the programming further uh, using internet uh, capabilities. Yeah. Well, let, let me let me chime in for a second, Howard, sure. on uh, on the Jazz Appreciation Month activities at, sure. the, at the Armstrong House. Uh, in addition to a Love Supreme, uh, 1964 was the release of Louis Armstrong's "Hello Dolly." Oh. Yeah, we all we all smile at that, but look, think of it in context. Here's Louis Armstrong, one of the greatest jazz musicians in history, who you know re 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 revolutionized jazz in the 1920s with his Hot Five and Hot Seven, a terrific career. And then in 1964, the Beatles had had seven number one hits, and I'm old enough to remember that string of hits. Mm -hmm. And who knocks them off the throne? But Louis Armstrong, you know, who'd been making records since the 1920s. And so it was a huge hit for him. Louis was very proud of it, of what he did with it. Um, the producers of the Broadway show Hello, Dolly, reported that people were coming to the box office and asking for their money back because they had heard the record, 
gone to the Broadway show expecting to see Louis Armstrong, and all they got was Carol Channing. You know, <laughs> uh, they, were, they were asking for their money back. So uh, mm -hmm. it was it was a big moment in Louis's career, and this is the anniversary. The details will be on our website, which gets back to your your question. Uh, we're collaborating with another cultural here in Queens. Uh, to really do a big uh, Louis Armstrong screening of the motion picture Hello Dolly that he was in with Barbara Streisand and really talk about the history of the song and what it meant in Louis's life and career. Well, in the movie, but, I mean, they, that's the climactic moment and really makes the end of the movie when suddenly Streisand turns and, and Louis is there. Yeah, the, yeah, the, uh, the, right? the, the movie is not... Is not not a great movie, and Lewis lights up the screen when he comes yeah. out, as he did in so many movies. He was in a lot of B movies, and he'd come out and just lift up the whole movie when he appeared. Uh, that's another remarkable facet of Lewis's career. He's the, he was the first African American to have feature billing in a major motion picture. I mean, he was in more than 35 motion pictures. Well, but, wouldn't it be great if we could get Turner Classic Movies to uh, do a night of Louis Armstrong movies? With that would, that would be terrific. That'd be pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And you know, a great, a great, great movie that's never been reissued since its theatrical release. It's not on VHS. It's not on DVD. And that's Satchmo the Great, oh. which is a documentary with Edward R. Murrow, and it's fabulous. It follows Louis throughout Europe and Louis's tour of Africa, and it's a fabulous, fabulous motion picture. Footage of Louis Armstrong playing with the New York Philharmonic and Leonard Bernstein playing St. Louis Blues. It's a great, great movie. It's never been issued commercially, and I, I don't know why. There must be some hang-up with the rights and permissions. Mm. I'd like to see a man, was it a man called Adam again, too? He plays second build to, uh, you know, uh, Sammy Davis Jr., but it's a very powerful performance. You know. It is. In fact, in that in that nightclub scene, Lewis was supposed to, the character he's portraying is he's an old, washed-up jazz musician who's behind the times, but he came out and did the performance and just lit up the whole nightclub scene. You know, it didn't didn't go according to the script because everybody was having <laughs> such a groove listening to Louis Armstrong. Uh, there's another uh, interesting motion picture, Paris Blues, in yeah. which... Sidney Poitier and Paul Newman play expatriate jazz musicians in Paris, and Lewis kind of plays himself. But he upstages Paul Newman something awful. I love Paul Newman, but they're both playing jazz musicians. They're in this European train compartment, and Paul Newman is saying, yeah, Daddy, can you dig it? And, and Lewis just comes across as much more convincing as a jazz musician than Paul Newman. So, well, yeah, no, why. <laughs> yeah, so that, uh, that's, that's, that's a great program, Louis Armstrong on film. We've done exhibits on Louis on film, and you could have a film series that would be a knockout. Sure, high society also. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. But, and, Ken, and, it, it would seem to me that the Smithsonian would be, you know, in the best position to really uh, make use of, or, I mean, maybe it's not something to be done immediately, but to try to um, uh, disseminate more information through its affiliates and through its websites, pushing out as opposed to expecting communities to come in, you know, using, using again, Internet uh, capacities. Is there movement in that direction? Yeah, well, yeah, there actually is, and it's something that we're at the, I guess we're probably at the fourth inning of this whole effort here. Um, the uh, institution recognized uh, that we have some incredible music assets, period. Uh, every museum does, and we um, find ourselves uh, technologically uh, behind the times in being able to disseminate this information and realize also that um, these, this content, I should say, realizing that um, even loaning objects, you're only going to get a percentage, a small percentage of those objects out into affiliate museums. So there are, and I was actually up uh, in New York this past weekend at the Chamber of Music America conference and the week before at the Jazz Education Network conference, uh, talking to those communities about, with us launching a digital music museum, oh. how how would that best serve your constituents, your audiences? What what would you like to see or what would need to be there so that it would be something of value versus us putting uh, this 
this uh, up and thinking that it's going to serve the broad audience uh, based upon our vision, what is it that through your, your members and your audience will provide the greatest access? And it's been very interesting to get those, that feedback because everybody approaches it differently. If you're an artist, you're typically uh, you having a, a collection digitized and seeing it is one thing, but typically you wouldn't have to put your hands on it. We, we want to feel it, we want to smell it, we want to go through that process. Uh, uh, scholars, uh, they have, um, they can live with, at times, seeing the objects online, provided that it's a very clearly uh, representation of it, and 3D imaging is now becoming more and more um, um, a viable to do that. But really, the, the big thing is, is our collections that we have, institution-wide, is providing this vehicle to be able to to get it outside of the brick and mortars that they live in and um, it's it's an exciting effort underway it's a very big project and we're discovering that collections that we didn't know the, the enormity of um, live in places that we would think about the Natural History Museum has over 8,000 objects that relate to music uh, and so you can get a sense and the institution has 138 million objects I'm told. Uh, so we, we have a lot of work ahead of us, but that to me seems to be a, a very viable and uh, exciting way to be able to to extend what we do beyond us, the museums we have, and our affiliates. Well, again, uh, uh, Jazz a play, uh, Jazz Appreciation Month seems like such a good um, uh, leverage uh, time hook, a news hook, in which to do this kind of dissemination and try to take the music to audiences that usually don't uh, come in for the music. And I have a question from a woman named um, Frederic. Uh, could the Smithsonian encourage somehow libraries to celebrate Jazz Appreciation Month? Or is that something that the Library of Congress has to do? Or no, are you working with the Library of Congress on that? Or how? Yeah, no, the libraries actually already do that. So it's, <laughs> yeah, we over many years have, uh, actually in the, the inception of Jazz Appreciation Month, have targeted libraries to be a a very important partner out there, and providing them with, uh, besides the posters, opportunities, and and ways to see about how to um, develop programs in the in the libraries. I actually got uh, a uh, an email today about um, a library in in uh, Virginia wanting us, myself, or somebody in the orchestra to come in there and um, um, engage a youth audience through. Uh, uh, some jazz literature, meaning um, um, uh, early they call it youth books for youth um, from the age is it, um, uh, elementary to middle school age. So they're 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 very proactively looking at how to to take advantage of this audience that comes into libraries, and it's an audience that we find to be very uh, uh, interested and in, continue to to connect with. Yeah, we do a program called um, Readers or Leaders, and we um, collaborate with the the you know, DC Library System and certainly the Anacostia Library and others, uh, where we have sort of celebrity people come in and read to kids and you know choose different topics uh, that they can focus on, and we kind of pick pick uh, you know look at timely topics. So yeah, there there are a number of different ways. I, I think there's you know a lot of interest. In that, Michael is the. In that. I, I'm sorry, March. I didn't mean to. Mm -hmm. Michael is the Queens uh, co uh, College Library also involved in uh, Jazz Appreciation Month in some way. Well, the uh, Queens College has a vibrant school of music, uh, and they have a terrific jazz studies program. And Tony O'Hart and Michael Mossman are the heads of that program. The founders of the program were Jimmy Heath and Donald Byrd and Sir Roland Hanna. So, so they participate in Jazz Appreciation Month, and of course, uh, we do also, and we're we're part of uh, Queens College. So the the general library in itself does not, but but we we do it for the college. And the Jazz Appreciation, uh, the Jazz Journalists Association has also been trying to offer our members as uh, people who libraries could invite in, so uh, journalists could play their favorite music, talk to people who are coming into the libraries. And I, I get the impression though that it really needs to be the community activist who goes to the library and say, you know, Jazz Appreciation Month is coming. Can you do something for us for the community? 
and that's sort of the the, of the premise of, of our whole conversation tonight. You know, if, uh, if, if it's not originating from the museum, can it originate from the community and the museum pick it up? And, you know, you've all spoken to your openness to uh, receive suggestions. Um, so that's, I think that's really uh, impressive, and I hope that uh, it gets uh, walked like it's talked, and I think it probably does. Uh, Michael and I were able to collaborate on a, uh, a party at the Langston News Library, community library, last year in honor of uh, Jazz Appreciation Month, and that was a lot of fun, and I hope we're going to do something like that again. Um, there's another question, I think, from the um, Seattle Art Museum. Has Louis, Louis Armstrong House considered any restaurant or lounge partnership to help further engage audiences in events or the primary Louis Armstrong House experience? The culture of jazz includes food and libations, so it seems like a good fit. I mean, I remember having some very nice food at the Louis Armstrong House Museum around a Christmas. Well, time. well, food was important to Louis. Food is so important for community, and it's important to the Louis Armstrong House Museum. Um, we did an exhibit soon after we opened called Louis Armstrong and Food, because uh, we have pictures of Louis eating food all over the world, eating kebabs <laughs> in Egypt and, and eating uh, noodles in Japan. Uh, we have annotated menus that Louis brought back from his world travels. We have Lucille's cookbooks, and of course you can open them to the pages with the most stains to see her favorite <laughs> recipes. And so food is big, and we do interpret food. Uh, as you remember, we, we do have a terrific soul food caterer from the community, and so for our events, we hire her, and so we try to put out a big, a good spread whenever, whenever we have people into the museum or have a reception in the garden. And, and food's important. I mean, food brings people together. Right. Amen. Amen. I now, to, 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 to answer, excuse me, to answer that question though about about uh, 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 future plans, uh, one thing I do want to mention: we're building an education center across the street from the historic house, and I'm proud to say we've raised 20 million dollars for design and construction, and we've completed the design. We have all the blueprints, and God willing, we'll have a shovel in the ground this summer. We wow. investigated putting, we considered and investigated putting a food service in that visitor center. And we elected not to do it for a couple of reasons. One is it brings up issues in the museum of smells and fire and vermin. Uh, food services traditionally are not a money maker for the museum. I mean, they help keep people at the museum, but it's not a source of earned income for the museum. But the other big factor, and this is the main point I wanted to make, we send people out in our community to eat. We're in an international community. There are more than 150 languages spoken in Queens every day. Within a few blocks of us, you can go to a tortilla that makes their own fresh corn tortillas every day. Uh, you can go to a famous Italian deli that's been there for 80 years. I mean, there are all sorts of great places to eat in Corona, Queens, and we enjoy sending our visitors out into the community to eat. Well, I'll say this for the Anacostia Community Museum. I'm going. I'm very excited about uh, the Louis Armstrong Museum, and uh, we'll certainly pass this information on to our uh, our public program uh, folks to see if maybe there's some sort of a collaboration that we can we can do. Oh, well, love it, love it. Yeah, let's do it. I think what's real important here, and it's across the board, is I mean, you've got to be able to make this information more available to the public. The, the experience and the information and music certainly unites people. So I think it's a, a, a wonderful match made in heaven. Yep. <laughs> yep. Uh, let's see. We can help with. Um, Seattle is saying we can help with the. Uh, Turner Classic Music and documentaries, and we should ping them back with a message about how to uh, <coughs> try to institute some program of Louis Armstrong uh, films, and uh, that Edward R. Murrow is actually great. That would be, that'd be very cool. Thank you, the mm -hmm. Arts Museum. I think we're getting close to wrapping up here, and um, let me just uh, ask if there's anything that you folks want to say that you haven't said yet. Ken? Yeah, actually, I was thinking about an access, back to the point of access, and um, one thing that we offer uh, throughout the institution is um, fellowship and internships. 
<laughs> which uh, really are are critical to um, our developing and understanding our collections, to connecting to young young minds, and helping us uh, see how we can extend ourselves in a way that we hadn't visualized before, in, in involving them and engaging them, and uh, helping uh, with in future exhibitions and online. Um, Presence. I, I have had the benefit of many interns that have come in and actually provided wonderful blogs on our oral history site, um, talking about a variety of the the um, interviews that we've done, taking a cell of their of of their really voluminous life and talked about a particular period of time that um, looks at American history, 20th century American history, to whatever it may be that they chose. But the, the, the internship program and fellowship program is really a lifeblood to the institution, but also takes what we do back out into those communities because they become our... our um, Ambassadors. Thank you very much. Absolutely. That's a beautiful <laughs> word. And I want to also say that when the, the cool thing is, again, young people can go to the Smithsonian. Of course, we are individual museums, and we're always wanting the, you know, these brilliant young people to come to our museum. But what's available to them is to choose. And I've had some fabulous. My, my intern, since I am uh, the uh, work in the area of public affairs, my interns um, all work on communications on our e-calendar, which I want to encourage you know, all your listeners to subscribe to by going to the website and clicking on it, and um, and also on our social media efforts. And so there there are lots of opportunities. And if and if a young person has a particular interest, like music or jazz or whatever, there's an opportunity to kind of manifest a project that they can work on that. So um, I think that's a, a a wonderful thing to do. So I do want to say that um, uh, folks are invited to come to our website. Um, I don't know if you're going to provide this information at the end of the program, but um, we're at anacostia.si.edu, and if you go to si.edu, you can find all the museums. And sign up for our e-calendar, and that way, and, and you'll get our programming every month. Um, you'll get it about a half a month in advance to let you know what's, what's happening at the Anacostia Museum. The Smithsonian is your tax dollars at work. Yep. It's all free. You as well use it, yeah. Yeah. And Mike, Michael, do, does the Louis Armstrong House Museum welcome interns and need volunteers? And oh, absolutely. I mean, we have interns that work with the collections, but more importantly, we have docents that give tours of Louis Armstrong's house. And we have an active do docent recruitment program. And if you have what it takes, you can mm -hmm. get signed on at the Armstrong House and give 40-minute tours. And uh, we've had people describe it as a life-changing experience. Uh, we had a young man from the community, uh, Dominican-American uh, uh, youngster who was 15 years old when he started for us. It expanded his world. His world was 37th Avenue. And then he saw celebrities and people from all over the world come in. He gave them tours. Now he's a uh, Lance Corporal in the United States Marine Corps. I mean, it just it changed his life. So, so we love docents of all ages and, and from all over the greater New York City area. And you, you can also find out more about the DOSA program and everything else we're doing on our website, lewisarmstronghouse.org. And you can like us on Facebook, too. Uh, last year, our Facebook followers went from 800 to 13,000. And so uh, yeah. uh, come, come check it out. It's amazing. So I think the message is uh, if you're in the community and you have desires to uh, work with these museums, get in these museums, go to the museums and start addressing these officers find the curators and make some noise and get them to do it, what you want to do. It may take a couple uh, months or a couple semesters, but uh, it sounds like impact is uh, possible to be had. So with that, I want to uh, thank Michael Cogswell, Marsha Baird Burris, and Kim, Ken Kimmery, and uh, thank you very much for your participation tonight, all the attendees. This has been Talking Jazz, produced by the Jazz Journalists Association and presented by the Jazz Crews as part of its Anita E. Berry Educational Fund with extra support from Century Media Partners. This is the last of our first season of Talking Jazz uh, programs, and we're going to start again uh, next February, February 19th with a discussion about jazz and democracy 
whether uh, jazz carries the values of democracy with Dr. West from the Jazz and Democracy Project and also a representative from Jazz and Lincoln Center's Let Freedom Swing educational program. And then we're going to have some pro uh, panels later in the spring with um, uh, editors of new publications about jazz, new platforms of radio about jazz, and so on uh, through June. So again, uh, I'm Howard Mandel, president of the Jazz Journalists Association. I hope if uh, you've been watching and you're interested in using media to support jazz, you take a look at our website, which is jjanews.org, and think about joining the JJA. And again, thanks, Ken. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, Marsha. It's been great talking to you, and we'll talk soon again, I hope. Thank, thank you very you. much, Howard. Yeah, Marcia. thank you, Howard. Thank you, Ken, Marsha. Thank, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Marsha. We'll be in touch, all of us. <laughs> yeah. Right. Good night. Good night.